So I'm going to talk briefly in my time about the PDBX MMSIF data format and dictionary. I'll give you some examples of syntax and try to give you an understanding of the organization of, of the files. Hold on. So the first thing I want to point out, as been mentioned by Greg, is that the PBX MMSIS data standard format is flexible. We can extend it as need be. It's, it is human readable. You know, the examples that you saw before, you could see that it really was a, a readable uh, format. Uh, even though it's designed to be read by machines, it is also available for humans. There are no limits in the width and precision of the data fields. So if we come up with a methodology which requires numbers that are wider than what would have normally been allowed in a PDB file format, we could accept that. The data values are controlled by a dictionary. The values must adhere to the various types that we define as regular expressions. Enumerations, limits that we are in the dictionary. I'll show you an example of that later. The relationships between categories are enforced by what we call parent-child relationships. And I'll give you an example of that, but that allows you to have multiple values linked up to one other category in the sense of, think of a citation. A citation, you have a single citation and you might have many authors. The data are organized in what we call categories and they look like tables and they're all the same set of keys and values. We can rapidly extend the, the, these, the dictionary and therefore the methodologies as scientific methodologies evolve. The dictionary is publicly available at this website, uh, which I have I just indicated over here. We provide tools to help validate data against this dictionary. And I'd like to just point out that this is the basis of other dictionaries. The model SIF dictionary, which is used by AlphaFold, AlphaDB and AlphaFold, uh, use a, a format that's similar to the PDBX MM SIF with some extensions. So therefore the core area is able to be read. The IHM SIF dictionary is used by the PDB dev diction, uh, deposition system. It is for integrated hybrid methods. But again, the coordinate section is that we look very similar between methodologies. And all these dictionaries, we have similar information for instance, structure title, et cetera. So if you develop a methodology that could read one, one dictionary, extending it for some specific new data items in another one is relatively easy. This page shows you the current, where our dictionary resource is available. And this is a website that describes it. So the management of our PBX MMSIF dictionary, we are not the sole developers. We are not the sole creators of content and definitions. As Greg mentioned, it was developed in the late 90s by a group chartered by the uh, IUCR SIF group uh, to send uh, SIF for macromolecular data. We are one of the contributors as the WWPDB, but we also take input from the PBX MMSIF working group, which is a, a group of experts in the field of crystallography. We also take input from developers who are create extensions for their own dictionaries. Plus we get feedback from users. Here's an example of a dictionary for pH of crystallization conditions. So inside this dictionary, we have what we call allowed ranges for the dictionary. For pH, you expect to be for most biological samples from zero to 14, those are not the, and, and you will not expect to see anything in our archive that violates that. However, we also provide for the depositors advisory boundary conditions. So some statistical analysis of all the structures we have deposited into the, into the protein data bank showed that crystallization conditions tended to be between, have a pH between 3.5 and 10. Now, this doesn't say you cannot go beyond that. So there are examples in the archive of lysozyme crystals grown at pH 3.0. They're allowed, but they're unusual. We also have enumerations in the dictionary. And this shows an example of what we call the, the diffraction source. And we have a number of synchrotrons in, enumerated in here, along with their particular beam lines. This is, helps to ensure that there aren't typographical errors entered by depositors and allows us to uh, have a control of the data that's coming in and being put into the archive. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about the syntax of PBX MMSIF. As I mentioned, the data are presented in item value pairs. 
And we're going to describe an item is defined as a made up of a category and an attribute values. So we have a category name and an attribute name. So sort of like citation would be the category, ID would be the attribute, and we'll just call this an item. Data can be represented in tables, as you'll see in the next few slides. And there are various rules for quoting text. So it is possible to have single quotes, double quotes within, within a text string. And we follow the same specification of this SIF. And if anyone's interested, here's a URL for it. But the important thing to remember is that our dictionary regulates the content of the public archive. So here's a here's some examples. So we are showing for the structure of deoxyhemoglobin for HHB entry. Here's what the unit cell is reported as. So it's a table of cell and various attribute names. So the length of the A axis, B axis, C axis, the angles that are associated with it. We also have another syntax which is allowed, which is what we call loop syntax which is you enumerate what the actual items are. So we have a name and an ordinal, and then you have a list of data values. This is a table, a tabular type of format. Both are equally valid. We could represent the cell length as, as a table in the same way, but it's not required. So here's four different examples showing the same type of text. Uh, and shows the different ways of showing either we have the upper left corner where we're talking about uh, just items and values. Uh, we could have a more detailed quotation where it goes with multiple lines. It's please life slow, it's no. Uh, we could, as I said, we could loop it in terms of having multiple rows if need be in both syntaxes. So I will just briefly mention the parent-child relationships. As I indicated earlier, that you could have uh, a citation, which we have an ID, which links back up to multiple uh, authors. And we link these things together, and, and there are more extensive hierarchies available within the, within the dictionary relating the various categories together. So you Within the experimental category, we have an entry ID. The cell we showed you the entry ID. We could have multiple chain linked together and in a form of a hierarchy. So to talk about the general purpose uh, data file format, we're going to, the thing that ties a lot of the categories together within the, the data files are the is the entity. The entity represents a specific macromolecule polymer chain. It could represent branch uh, carbohydrates. It could represent individual lig uh, ligands or, or non-polymers or water molecules. And you can see here that in this particular example, polymer entity one has a sequence linked together with the same entity ID. So in terms of reading the PBX MMSIF sequence, this category, some people sometimes ask, what do you do with, for these non-single one-letter codes? We have an extended uh, format where we put in parentheses what our ligand code that we're using. This is for a phosphoserine. But if you think about that, a phosphoserine is really just a serine molecule with another modification. We provide the canonical one-letter code, uh, which would represent it by a serine. So if you're going to be doing a blast search, serine would be the one that you'd want to find. We have a mapping which shows how we number, how the public author refers to residues. We, are, we will number things internally and it's spelled in the public files in a sequential order. Bioinformaticians frequently want to know what is this sequence. I don't care what residue number the author chose. I just want to know it's the third residue in the sequence. So I show you this one. This is so in the schema. We have the first one in sequence is a histidine, but the author has chosen to use residue 311 in chain B. Uh, and this also depicts what is the proper alignment and registration for missing residues. So while, the, so in this particular example, 
we are showing uh, a large gap in the sequences for the structure. Uh, you could see that in 4LAD, there's a large gap in the, in the structure represented by this da dashed line. And you could see equivalently that the scheme shows there's a large region from 521 to 572. I'm missing the part of the middle. We're just missing, but we account for all the residues in the experimental in the experiment. We all, we enumerate all the non-polymers with its own separate scheme, uh, where we could indicate what the author's residue number, which was 154. It was a terbium, and how we represent it. We also represent each polymer chain, each specific separate ligand with an asymmetric ID, which is used to, to give you an inventory of the different different pieces. So we have a sulfate and acetate ions in the structure, as you can see from here. The coordinate section, as was already alluded to, is a little more extensive than the legacy PDB format. We retain the Moving from left to right, we have the full list of what everything is in, in column order, but I just want to highlight a few aspects. One is the ASIM-ID. This is what is used. Every polymer chain is labeled from A, Z, and then double letters. Every ligand is labeled in a similar way to give you a unique, a unique one. So if you think about it, you could have within a structure two copies of the same polymeric chain. We'll call that, say, entity one. We'll have the same sequence. They both have the same full sequence. But instance one might be, first instance might be ASMID A, and the other one might be B. We also, and as you could see, I mentioned the residue ordinal. This is the numbering from the start of the sequence, in this case, three. The author, however, chose to label it as chain A, residue two. And the numbering of author residue numbers could be whatever the, meets their scheme. Uh, we frequently have seen expression tags start with negative numbers. It's perfectly legal. The only thing we require is that there has to be an increasing value in going through the sequence. We have a way of showing intermolecular links using the strut con category. And I just want to show how this, so this is a zinc finger. And I'm just showing that the metallo links between the zinc and the hist two histidines and two cysteines. We are seeing the re residues 201, I'm not, zinc 201, and how a metallo link. This is equivalent to the legacy PDB file format, and you're getting the same information just in a different place. Uh, the PDB format limits the precision that you could provide. So you could see a distance of 2.14 angstrom. And in the PVX MM SIF file, we have 2.138, since we do not have the limitations on space. So, in summary, the PVX MM SIF dictionary provides, and the tools that we have provide a well regulated archive. And these two, the tools of the dictionary ensure the data are all conform to the, these formats. Our PBX MM SIF uh, dictionary is extensible, and we will rep, we will make changes as experimental methods evolve and continue to do so. I covered the basic syntax, and I gave you some ideas of the high level PBX MM SIF model uh, it, data. So I'll stop here and ask if there are any questions. So we have a few questions in the chat. One of them is asking about. Can you please provide a regular expression that represents the extended format for the extending PDB IDs? Uh, yes, uh, I will dig it up later, but it is available on the on the WWPDB News. I cannot give it to you right off. I don't want to just type it in over here, but we we can provide that information in the chat later or, or later on send it to you. So the link is in the chat. Okay. Another question is. What is what about the currently first character for the extended PDB IDs? That is undecided at this particular moment. The choice of the extended PDB, the important aspect, there are two two things that were important. One was that we should be able to find within the literature anything that is a PDB ID. So that's why we have the PDB underscore prefix. And at the same time, ensure that we have extensibility into the future. Uh, 
I don't believe we have decided what the first character will be, whether it needs to be numeric. I think it is going to be numeric, but I'd have to double check that. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Could you please elaborate upon protein ligand interaction? Sure. So protein ligand interactions. Okay, so within covalent links to a protein to a ligand interaction, say a, a chloromethyl ketone inhibitor, you'll see a connectivity between in the struct con category that physically says there's a covalent bond there. Other interactions that it might just be we're in the proximity of that is not recorded anymore. So if you if you were interested in knowing what is the environment around a water, our website does have some views of that, but we do not have uh, we do not have recorded within this model file and anymore. We used to have represented with site records, but we we stopped using that about four years ago. The ligands in the rcsb.org website, there is a ligand section within the structure summary page that can give you that environmental view. But that's not accessible from within the model file. Okay, are we done? Or do we have more time for another question? The questions are being answered in the chat. Okay. Um, I think we should move on to Brian's okay. talk. So I will, then I will finish up here and say thank you very much for your time. Next up is Dr. Brian Hudson, who will talk about lifting the lid off the black box of the PBXMM SIF files.